We've been talking about uh, the book Biological Information, and um, the full title is Biological Information, New Perspectives. You'll notice it up on the desk here. Um, uh, it's written by several people whom most of you know, uh, Michael Behe, William Dembski, John Sanford, and uh, Editor-in-Chief Robert Marks, um, as well as Bruce Gordon. Published by World Scientific Publishing, uh, when Springer dropped the book after it had contracted to publish it. Um, it's published in 2013, so we're a little bit yet late. We're even later because um, it's the pr proceedings of a symposium held at Cornell University, not under university's auspices, but at the university in 2011, and hosted by John Sanford, who is a faculty of the university. And uh, the book can be purchased for somewhere between $120 and $180, depending on who you get it from. Um, for those of you who find it uh, uh, worthwhile to have that kind of thing in print form, I highly recommend buying it. Uh, if for nothing else, a donation to a company that took a uh, significant risk by uh, publishing a book that had already been boycotted. Um, but for those of you who either don't have the money or don't have the will, whichever, it can be obtained in toto for free as an internet download. Uh, and there's the website for it. Book looks like that. The book contains a basically four parts, general introduction and then biological information and genetic theory, which is the part we're looking at right now. Theoretical molecular biology, which we'll get into later, and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is, uh, indicates that this is not just an intelligent design book. There are other people who question that biology uh, as presently looked at can create the kind of information that is needed, even though they don't want to go the route of an intelligent designer. The particular chapter we're looking at this morning is Tira, the character of adaptation, written by Winston Ewart, who's a graduate student, uh, William Dembski, and Robert Marx. And if you'll notice that uh, Winston Ewart, is, uh, Marx is Ewart's uh, professor. The abstract is actually pretty complete, but may need a little unpacking if you're not familiar with uh, uh, computer uh, modeling of evolution. Tierra is a digital simulation of evolution for which the stated goal was the development of open-ended complexity and a digital, quote, Cambrian explosion, end quote. However, Tierra failed to produce such a result. A closer inspection of Tierra and evolution's adaptations showed very few instances of adaptation through the production of new information. Instead, most changes result from removing or rearranging the existing pieces within a Tierra program. The open-ended development of complexity depends on the ability to generate new information, but this is precisely what Tierra struggles to do. The character of Tierra and adaptation does not allow for open-ended complexity, but is similar to the character of adaptations found in the biological world. In other words, this is actually a good model for biology, or a fairly good model, and because of that, it doesn't evolve in the way that uh, those who designed it desired. Introduction, Tierra, a digital evolution simulation, was originally developed by Thomas Ray in 1989. Some such simulations attempted um, attempt to accomplish a specific task or to solve a particular problem. Examples include finding a phrase. That's uh, Dawkins' weasel. Logic function synthesis and designing an antenna. While such simulations take inspiration from the concepts of natural selection and random mutation, they differ from Darwinian processes in a significant way. Such examples of evolutionary computation have a predetermined goal. While biological evolution, as commonly understood, does not. 
Tira does not define such a predetermined goal. Instead, the intent is simply to observe the outcome of the evolutionary process. As Ray states, the creatures invent their own fitness functions. Now, I have to say that's not quite true. And the reason it's not quite true is because it does have a predetermined goal. The programs are intended to reproduce themselves. So, yes, there is a goal, but it's, it's only the very simple goal of reproducing oneself, which is considered an, an evolutionary goal. That is not to say that research using Tierra has no goal. In fact, Tierra's goal is much more ambitious. Ray's intent with Tierra was nothing less than to simulate the genesis of complexity and open-ended evolution, analogous to the Cambrian explosion. And here is the quote. While the origin of life is generally recognized in his event of the first order, there is another event in the history of life that is less well known, but of comparable significance. The origin of biological diversity and macroscopic multicellular life during the Cambrian explosion 600 million years ago. So he was taking dead aim at, at the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion is an event recorded in the fossil record during which there is a relatively sudden shift in the evolution of life on Earth. That is, if you assume long ages. Prior to this point, biological life was almost entirely composed of single cell organisms. However, in a brief period of geological time, there was an explosion of biological forms in which most of the phyla now in existence appeared suddenly in the fossil record. The causes behind this geological event are debated within biological circles. And we've just been through Darwin's doubt and, uh, not that long ago, and perhaps some of you may remember some of that debate. Why is the goal to produce a Cambrian explosion in artificial life? The underlying intent is to produce countless forms through an evolutionary process similar to what is found in biology. The potential of this process in biology appears to have un been unleashed during the Cambrian explosion. If artificial evolution could be unleashed in the same way, we might also be able to produce a plethora of fascinating forms analogous to those for found in biology. Essentially, once evolution, whether biological or artificial, has produced a Cambrian explosion, the rest of evolution should proceed easily. I would say that if it could be, then I think the rest of evolution could proceed fairly easily. Ray's view is that the complexity needed to reach a, uh, that the complexity needed to reach a critical mass. That's a hard sentence to read. Once past this point, evolution's creativity would be unleashed. In the case of biological life, this happened during the Cambrian explosion. Tierra was Ray's attempt to give evolution the critical mass it needed. In fact, there were three different versions of Tierra, each starting with more complexity in an attempt to kickstart the evolutionary process. Tierra produced a variety of interesting phenomena, including parasites, hyperparasites, social behavior, cheating, and loop unrolling. However, 20 years after the, the introduction of Tierra, the conclusion is that Tierra did not produce a Cambrian explosion or open-ended evolution. Though Ray described Tierra in evolution as generating, quote, rapidly diversifying communities of self-replicating organisms exhibiting open-ended evolution by natural selection, others disagree. And these, by the way, are not necessarily um, uh, uh, design advocates, and um, they are in the, uh, uh, they're in the published literature as well. Artificial life systems such as Tierra and Avida produce a rich diversity of organisms initially, yet ultimately peter out. By contrast, the Earth's biosphere appears to have continuously generated new and varied forms throughout the four billion years of the history of life. Again, that's assuming the age. These strong increasing trends in in imply a directionality in biological evolution that is missing in the artificial evolutionary systems. Ray has recently stated that he regards Tierra as having failed to reach its goal. He describes the evolution seen within Tierra as transitory. He no longer considers himself part of the artificial life community and is now studying biological questions rather than those of artificial evolution. He has basically quit. The absence of a Cambrian explosion in artificial life demands an explanation. If biological evolution produced a Cambrian explosion, why does artificial evolution not do the same? 
Our inability to mimic evolution in this regard suggests a deficiency in our understanding of it. In the words of Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Tyrian evolution can be characterized as an initial period of high activity producing a number of novel adaptations followed by barren stasis. It would appear that Tierra easily produced the novel information required for a variety of adaptations. Why did it cease? If Tierra could produce novel information, it should continue to do so as long as it was run. However, if Tierra was incapable of producing such information, it should not have been able to produce the adaptations that it did. So what's going on? A closer look at Tierra evolution reveals an important characteristic of the adaptations. Tierra started with a designed ancestor to seed the population. In other words, it presupposed something like an origin of life and was concerned with the development of complexity after that point. The ancestor provides initial information to Tierra. Adaptations primarily consist of rearranging or removing that information. Open-ended evolution requires adaptations which increase information. However, such adaptations are rare in Tierra. Tierra's informational trajectory is reversed from what evolution requires. It is dominated by loss and rearrangement with only minimal new information instead of being dominated by the production of new information with minimal cases of removal or rearrangement of information. Long-term evolutionary progress is dependent on the generation of new information. If Tierra is capable of generating new information even in small amounts, does this not provide evidence that Darwinism can account for new information? Many small gains will eventually accumulate into a large amount of information. However, if this were true, we, should, we would see evidence of it within Tierra. There ought to be a steady stream of information gaining adaptations rather than the stasis actually observed. The purpose of this paper is to review the published results of Tierra and evolution. By investigating these results, we elucidate the characteristics of adaptations found within this system. In particular, we demonstrate that TRN programs adapt primarily through loss and rearrangement. Tierra initially appeared to hold great promise as a model of biological evolution displaying open-ended evolution. However, we see that the character of TRN developments was never that which could produce open-ended evolution. It's not creating enough new information. Description of Tierra programs. Tierra seeks to create artificial life within a computer. In some cases, similar evolutionary simulations are meant to model biology. As a result, the rules of the system are derived from a simplification of biological reality. Other cases see, seek to use the evolutionary process to solve a particular problem. The rules of the system are derived from the nature of the problem being solved. In contrast, Tierra seeks to use the underlying rules of computer system, trusting the evolutionary process to make use of whatever medium it finds itself in. However, in developing Tierra, Ray did not maintain perfect fidelity to the design of, I would say, standard computer hardware. Instead, the design of Tierra was also influenced by the design of biological systems. He was concerned, based partially on the results of previous similar experiments, that computer code would be too brittle prompting him to make design decisions to make the code more evolvable. He realized that random modifications to the computer code would too easily break existing functionality and make it difficult to evolve new behaviors, which isn't necessarily the case in life. And life actually tolerates um, uh, changes in code a little better than computer programs do sometimes, although it's much more complex. Uh, Tierra programs can be considered similar to proteins. A Tierra program is a sequence of instructions in much the same way that a protein is a sequence of amino acids. Both of these can be compared to English sentences. The function of a sentence, Tierra program, or a protein is determined in some way by the sequence which makes it up. The meaning of a sentence is determined by the letters which make up the sentence. If different letters are substituted into the sentence, or the letters are rearranged a different sentence with a completely different meaning will likely result. In a similar way, the structure and function of a protein is determined by the sequence of amino acids that make up the protein. The behavior of a TRN program is also <coughs> determined by the sequence of instructions that make up the program. Programs need to refer to locations inside themselves. This is especially true for TRN as the program must copy itself. In actual computer systems, 
This is typically done through the use of numerical offsets, that is, a reference to position 5 in the program. The problem with such a technique is that adding or removing instructions will tend to change all of the position numbers in the program. This will leave all the position numbers incorrect, thereby breaking the program. This is a primary cause of the brittleness that Ray was trying to avoid. Now, to be fair, if you're using BASIC, for example, you can actually use a label. And in fact, what he's done is use a particular variant of that kind of labeling. You know, go to 20, and then 20 is a particular sequence, and you can have nothing before 20, or you can have 19 statements before 20. When biological proteins need to interact with other biological entities, they make use of binding sites. A binding site is a particular region on a protein to which other molecules bind. Which molecules will bind depend on the exact binding site properties. As a result, changing the binding site will change how the protein interacts with other molecules, and thus, possibly, its function. Tierra borrows this idea by having some of the instructions function as labels. A label consists of a sequence of NOP0 and NOP1 instructions which are considered complementary to one another. Each label binds to another label with the complementary instructions. That is, a label NOP1, NOP1, NOP0 will bind to the label NOP0, NOP0, NOP1. Figure 1 shows the use of labels within the ancestor program. We'll see that shortly. This solves the problem of referencing different parts of the program with specific position numbers because the program can refer to the label itself, a referencing technique that will still work if the label is relocated. English sentences do not have a precise analog to biological binding sites. The sites can, however, be considered roughly similar to punctuation. A binding site or label is useless by itself as it has no actual function except to bind other things together. As such, binding sites modify the rest of the system in useful ways while lacking intrinsic functionality. Punctuation acts much the same way in English sentences. Consider the difference between no price too high and no comma. Price too high. Actually, I think the historical reference is no period price too high. And uh, 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 the period got dropped and a lady bought something that was much more expensive than her husband wanted her to buy and they sued uh, the uh, telegraph company and uh, and won. And from now on, they spell out the periods as stop instead of, so it would be no, stop, price too high. None of the words in the phrases have been modified. Nevertheless, the meaning has been changed significantly. Tierra programs contain instructions. The exact sequence of instructions specifies the operation of the program. Some of the instructions form labels, which are like binding sites. Binding sites perform no tasks in isolation, but manipulate the functions of other instructions in the program. And there is figure one. And you can see that this is complementary to that one. This is complementary to that. So when the program gets down to here, it jumps back up to there. And that's the idea of having uh, sequences. And I think that you can put other instructions behind here. And then when you come to this uh, next one that will tell you where to go, uh, you'll jump down to there. Ancestor. Tierra runs by simulating many different programs inside of a computer, running inside a computer. As time goes on, older programs are killed off. As the programs run, they make copies of themselves to produce new programs. Some of these programs have mutations and thus are slightly different from their predecessors. These mutations randomly replace, insert, or remove instructions like similar mutations in a DNA sequence. There's a selective force present as all those programs which are able to replica replicate more times before they die will leave more offspring and thus dominate the population through a process like natural selection. This is similar to the idea of a soup of self-replicating proteins. 
In terms of sentences, it is as if the computer simulating Tierra is reading sentences and following their instructions. In this case, the sentence reads something like, make a copy of this sentence. Thus, as long as the simulation is kept running, more and more copies are made. If some sentences provide better instructions for making copies, they will tend to dominate the population. In all of these situations, an ancestor is needed, that is, the initial self-replicating program. Tierra starts with a program that is capable of replicating itself. And I'm not reading this verbatim, and uh, if you want the ellipses, go to the book. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. Well, not quite all day, but too long. A depiction of the structure of the original programs can be found in figure one, which we just saw. The ancestor is important in the case of Tierra because the adaptations mostly derive from rearranging the information contained in that ancestor. Parallel Tierra. Further development of the Tierra program produced a version which made use of parallelism. Modern computers have the ability to run different code at the same time, that is, in parallel, having different processing units. By taking a large task and dividing it into smaller tasks which can be run at the same time, it is possible to form the whole task more quickly. An analogy is drawn between these parallel threads of execution and cells in a biological organism, which, by the way, will take different chromosomes and multiply them at the same time. Um, the developers were able to produce significant increases in parallelism in this version of Tierra. A network Tierra. A later version of Tierra was developed known as network Tierra. Results of th using this version have been published, but much of the data produced remains unanalyzed. The papers published about the results of network Tierra did suggest interesting results. A particular portion of the code in the Tierra program was duplicated, and while the two copies are initially identical, gradually the two copies diverge in their structure and function. However, no actual code was presented, and details as to exactly what is meant by divergence of structure and function were lacking. The lack of presented code presents an analysis, and thus further discussion about network Tierra will not take place here. Although, I suppose once the data becomes available, they may return to it. Looking for complexity. Tierra produced a number of adaptations. However, in order to produce a Cambrian explosion, adaptation alone is insufficient. It is necessary that new information is produced. Adaptations can lose or rearrange existing information and thus provide benefit without new information. There's a parallel to this idea in biology. Fish found in dark environments can lack functioning eyes. Since the eyes do not work in the dark, they are useless if not deleterious in that environment. As a result, the process of natural selection works to eliminate the eyes. Thus, we have a clear example of a biological adaptation being brought about through changes in the environment. However, this change has been produced by removing something rather than adding it, and therefore constitutes an example of reductive evolution. Could humans have evolved from a bacteria-like organism by successfully disabling functions? Clearly not. Biological experiments have been performed in which insects have undergone changes due to mutations that produce extra sets of wings or eyes. This does not appear to be a beneficial change for the insect. However, it does show the ability to produce novel features due to relatively minor mutations. In this case, we are, not, we are only observing the repeated expression of what the insect already is capable of producing. They already know how to produce one eye uh, or one wing, let's say. Now they have two wings, and they no longer have a halter, which is particularly useful. So you're actually losing information in that sense. Clearly, the insect already contained instructions, that is, genes, needed to construct the eyes and the wings. Mutations have simply caused these instructions to be repeated. Such duplication, uh, duplications, modified expressions, or rearrangement of the genetic information can produce significant results but many repetitions of this will not explain the origin of eyes or wings in the first place. The difference between two wings and one wing is not nearly as significant as the difference between one and zero. For biologists to determine if new information is produced in an, a an, ad in an adaptation can be difficult unless you sequence the gene. Because we have a limited understanding of biological systems, the nature of a biological adaptation can be difficult to determine. In an artificial system, such as Tierra, this is not the case. We can read the code and read it easily. We have a complete understanding of Tierra and thus can determine how any adaptation functions. 
In some cases, parts of Tierra programs are duplicated or moved. It does not make sense to count these as new information. The code was already in the, given in the ancestral program. It has merely been relocated. However, by duplicating and moving individual instructions, it is possible to construct any program. It only makes sense to appeal to a duplication or movement event when explaining a sequence of instructions. Tierra contains labels that are analogous to binding sites, which we've discussed before. These control the expression of the program. They changed within the time frame of Tierra and evolution, and these changes caused many of the adaptations observed. However, since the labels are inert in and of themselves, they are not solely responsible for the behaviors they produce. Rather, like the extra wings or the extra eye or eyes on an insect, they are manipulating the expression of other information that's, I would add, that's already there. Clearly, change can be produced by manipulating, clearly, change that can be produced by manipulating expression is limited. As such, we should not consider such changes as new information, or I would say as significantly uh, uh, as significantly large amounts of new information. Uh, I see I missed taking out a hyphen. In some cases, a mutation will be neutral. The program with the mutation performs exactly the same as a program without the mutation. This is not new information because it has no adaptive benefit. In other cases, a given instruction may produce no useful task. It can be replaced by almost any other instruction, and the program will execute in the same way. Due to the lack of specificity, such instructions do not carry informational content. The importance of new information is due to its being both necessary and difficult. Without new information, evolution is restricted to rearrangement of existing information. But there is only a limited number of ways to rearrange existing information. In order to avoid stasis, evolution must produce new information. Obtaining new information is difficult because it depends on improbable random events. In the case of Tierra, the improbability derives from having to select particular sequence, sequences of instructions with functionality. However, this difficulty depends on the length of the sequence. It should be expected that short sequences of new instructions can arise. The difficulty of selecting the correct instructions grows exponentially as the number of instructions is increased. What we find in Tierra is that most of the changes do not produce new information. In various ways, they rearrange the code already present in the ancestor. There are cases where new information, that I think that should be where, that's their typo, that is functional code is produced. Such cases consist of only small pieces of code. That is, we see a few scattered instructions, not blocks of new code. We have a couple of mutations there. Um, but if these small changes can be combined, it is not possible to gain, is it not possible to gain a large amount of information? Well, Tierra does not support the Darwinist contention. Despite the substantial amount of time spent running Tierra simulations, this predicted repeated information gains did not occur. On the other hand, we do observe significant adaptations making use of deletion or rearrangement. Tierra does not show new information. However, it fails to vindicate, uh, pardon me, Tierra does show new information. However, it fails to vindicate Darwin's, Darwinian theory's expectation of that information. Ray shot to produce a digital Cambrian explosion. It initially seemed to work out, but ultimately stalled. Closer inspection shows that even during that initial period, the process could not be characterized by an increase in information. The trajectory of Tierra was never corrected for open-ended evolution or unbounded complexity. And some examples, uh, we're going to look, and we're going to look even more briefly than the paper did. Uh, and the paper has a, uh, an appendix that goes into it more, in more depth if you want to. Um, this section will look at the individual programs produced by Tierra to show what kinds of changes were necessary to bring them into existence. Most of the actual code is taken from the Tierra distribution available from the Tierra website and discussed in the Tierra manual. In some cases, code that is considered uh, is taken from other papers published about Tierra. This section deals with a high-level overview of the adaptations observed in these programs. A look at the precise code involved can be found in Appendix 6. Parasites. 
Thiers' first interesting adaptation was parasitism. These programs were called parasites because they were unable to make copies of themselves on their own. However, they could replicate inside the terror simulation because they made use of the code in nearby ancestors. The parasite was shorter than the ancestor because it did not contain all of the code necessary to self-replicate. This allowed the parasite to replicate more quickly and more often, giving it a competitive advantage against the ancestors. Such parasites came to dominate Tierra. However, they required the pres presence of an ancestor in order to replicate, and thus never completely replaced the ancestors. If they had, the whole thing would have crashed. Immunity. Some Tierra research indicates that the ancestors develop immunity to parasites. Uh, neither the papers nor the official TR distribution appear to provide the actual code of a program which exhibits such immunity. Nevertheless, the method of immunity is described as follows. Immune hosts cause their parasites to lose their sense of self. That's a mutation uh, quite a ways up the road. Uh, by failing to retain the information on size and location. Um, hyperparasites. The evolutionary response to the parasites was hyperparasites. They were termed hyperparasites because they acted as a parasite on a parasite. While the original parasites used the code of other programs to replicate, the hyperparasites tricked parasites into copying the code of the hyperparasite. This technique worked because the parasite was executing code inside the hyperparasite, allowing the hyperparasite to take control of it. And I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff on that. By the time hyperparasites arise in the simulation, there have been a large number of changes to tier and genomes. However, most of these have no actual effect, and none of them consist of new functional code. Social behavior. The TRN programs eventually developed social behavior. A program was deemed to be social if it cannot replicate without being surrounded by s similar creatures. Once a program has finished replicating, it must return to the beginning of the program in order to make a second replication. In the case of social programs, the program jumped into the end of a previous program and then fell off into the start of the current program. And there's some illustrations. Um, the only significant change is that the jump that had previously gone to the first part of the program now jumps into memory behind it. Um, cheaters. Eventually a cheater arose which took advantage of the programs exhibiting the social behavior. A truncated program was created which sits between two social programs. When the social program attempted to jump into its predecessor's end, it ends up running into the cheater's code instead of its own. The cheater thus then uses the captured CPU to make additional copies of itself. As with the parasite, this ability derived from having deleted a large portion of the genome. The only change, which is not a deletion, is neutral. And we can say that because we can look at the code and compare it with the original code. Shorter program. The shortest self-replicating program uh, reported to evolve was 22 instructions in length. Interestingly, this was shorter than either of the parasitic designs. It was a very substantial reduction from the 80 instructions of the original ancestor. However, the structure was a subset of the original. As one might guess, the construction of this short program was largely done through the removal of instructions. However, two of the instructions of new code were inserted, which helped replace longer code. That is, the new instructions performed the same task as the original, but with less instructions required. So the short program actually did create two new little bitty pieces of code. Loop unrolling. An optimization known as loop unrolling also evolved in Tierra. This arose in a version of Tierra operating on slightly different rules. In this case, longer programs were rewarded for their length in order to discourage the development of shorter and shorter programs, which notice is what ha normally happens. It degenerates. Normally, a shorter program had an advantage in terms of the time it takes to make a copy, simply due to being shorter. Why aren't we all bacteria? Um, rewarding longer programs removed that advantage. As a result, the scheme is known as size neutrality. Under these rules, Tierra removes the incentive to shrink genomes and instead promotes the development of techniques to copy instru existing instructions faster. The evolutionary process managed to implement an optimization known as unrolling a loop. 
Ray presented this as an example of in, an intricate adaptation. However, Ray's perspective does not hold up to scrutiny. In fact, this adaptation results from a duplication of the code inside the program. Loop unrolling is an, an optimization which works through duplicating code in a loop. To repeat an action such as copying an instruction, a program must jump backwards in the code so as to re-execute the, the instructions. Uh, kind of a do loop kind of thing, if you're familiar with those. Um, this jump takes time and thus constitutes overhead cost. By repeating the contents of the loop, so you basically you repeat the exact same contents and then it reads straight down instead of having to jump up. It is possible to jump half as often, thereby reducing this extra cost, leading to more efficient replication. New functional code did show up, however, it was not directly related to the unrolled loop. Instead, the program basically lied about its length, causing it to receive a larger bonus. Ordinarily, this bonus would have been counteracted by the need to execute a longer program. However, this program neither executed nor copied the instructions in the second half. This means that it managed to gain the benefits of doubling the program length without any of the drawbacks. It developed junk DNA, if you like. To recap, we have investigated a number of examples of evolution in Tira. Table 1 shows a summary of the results. In the majority of the cases, we see that evolution proceeded by deleting instructions. These are some new instructions inserted. There are some new instructions inserted, but these are much smaller than the changes in other areas. As a result, we can clearly see that the Terran evolution is dominated by information-reducing mutations. Furthermore, we can categorize novel instructions by the variation of Tierra in which they arose. The probability column in Table 2 shows the probability of picking the instructions in a single random event. This gives relatively high probabilities of arriving at any of these changes with the exception of those required for size-neutral changes. For the purpose of comparison, the run from which the original version of Tierra pro programs was taken was for 1 billion instructions executed. So let's take a look at Table 1. You will notice that new code the shorter program has two, the unrolled loop has six, the parallelism has one. By far, the most mutations happen in removed code. Label changes, uh, mutations, uh, not much in the way of moved codes, but some. And duplicating instructions, of course, you can get a few. And table two, You'll notice that if you go back to table one and you take these two out, um, the, in the original program, there were two, which is a probability of one in a thousand. If you're running it a billion times, no surprise that you got it. Uh, parallel is one in 32, which there's really no surprise about. Size neutral, that's the cheating program, has a probability of one in a billion. But if you run a billion times, then that means that the probability is pretty close to uh, uh, 1 over e or so. So it's, that's not surprising either. Um, that's a chance in about 1 in 2.7 or so. The, uh, the interesting behaviors produced by Tierra are created mostly by arranging the information seeded into the simulation by its designer. New functional inst instructions were generated, but these are dwarfed by the size of other changes. They also consist of the tweaking of existing systems rather than development of new systems. They fail to provide a long-term model for information gain in Darwinian processes. Summary, the author of Tierra sought to create a digital Cambrian explosion whereby the power of the evolutionary process was unleashed. It is agreed that Tierra did not succeed in accomplishing this feat. Rather, the evolutionary activity within Tierra dies after only a transitory period. No Cambrian explosion occurs. Unlike many artificial life si situations, Tierra fo followed Darwinism by not imposing an external artificial fitness, other than, of course, reproduction. Tierran programs were not rewarded for performing calculations or solving problems. Rather, in Tierra, there was only survival and replication. As a result, Tierra paralleled biology more closely on this point. As discussed, the pattern of observed adaptation is similar between Tierra and biology. 
Rather than being a system which fails to imitate biology closely enough to produce a Cambrian explosion, TIER is a system which manages to imitate the character of directly observed biological ad adaptations and therefore doesn't produce the Cambrian explosion. Almost any design-based view of biological or origins allows the existence of some variations occurring by Darwinian mechanism while remaining skeptical that such mechanisms can explain all of biology, and I would submit that includes young earth creationism. Defenders of Darwinism claim that the distinction is artificial and that minor variations will necessary, necessarily eventually add up to large-scale uh, variation. Thierry provides evidence for the design position. Thierry uh, demonstrates adaptation, but also demonstrates that the adaptation fails to add up to open-ended complexity. It shows that minor variation does not imply major variation. If you like, ma macroevolution is not multiple ep ev uh, episodes of microevolution. The point being made seems obvious. One can get the right letter to complete the sentence by reasonable chance. One can delete or duplicate. And one can occasionally get a short word. After that, the probability of getting new functional information becomes astronomically low. This, by the way, is my opinion, not theirs. It is nice to know that a computer program sufficiently accurate in mimicking biological reality confirms what should be the obvious. Now, I will say the article is not likely to, do, to convince committed Darwinists, but it is nice to know that one does not have to ignore computational reality in order to be an ID ad advocate. Indeed, the available evidence seems to support ID rather than Darwinism on this issue. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. My first question comes along the question of time, which I didn't see much in it. Did they take into consideration that as soon as you get into multiple multicellular organisms, you get into slower reproductive rates, and you, you want to do the Cambrian explosion in five million years? Uh, was this issue not considered? Well, um, it, it's built into the uh, programming in a certain way. These, of course, are much simpler than the instructions for a cell. Uh, and in that way, they couldn't really model um, cellular reproduction completely because um, the instructions in a single cell would have been very difficult to... Uh, first of all, model as to their fitness for reproduction, and secondly, for their, uh, uh, the length does matter in the program just like it matters in, in uh, uh, biological reality. Um, a slower reproducing program doesn't, um, it, well, has a disadvantage in, in biological terms, and it has a disadvantage in Tierran terms. And I think that's why you see very little growth and mostly degeneration. You notice that they had a program that went from about 80 instructions originally to about uh, 22. And that's really what you expect. Very much like what happened with Spiegelman's monster in terms of RNA virus activity. That what you select for is the, low, the smallest um, information content that will actually reproduce, which makes intuitive sense. But on the other hand, that makes intuitive sense that that's not the way to get to some big, complicated, very slowly reproducing organism. That is, fish, let alone people, should be selected against. <coughs> So I think it did actually model uh, uh, evolution in that sense. It ma modeled it accurately, and that's why they didn't get a Darwinian explosion, because you can't get a Darwinian explosion 
with, uh, or at least it's highly improbable to get a Dar Darwinian e explosion. But did they put any actual time constraints in there at all? Well, and they and didn't uh, put uh, full full blown mm. constraints. No, but uh, but effective no. constraints, yes, because uh, because oh. if you have if you have an organism that multiplies, that can copy itself twice as fast as another, if you have a program that will copy itself twice as fast as another, then it will make two copies while the other uh, program is making one. That's a selective advantage. And if there's only, at, at first it fills up the, the space, but then if you have a, <laughs> if you, have a you know, a Malthusian environment where where programs can only multiply when other programs die off, uh, then the shorter, smaller programs have an advantage. And, and that's why things degenerate. That's why you have parasites, because they're smaller. You have smaller programs because they're smaller, and so forth. We have a comment way in the back. Certain creatures are said to have been with us for X millions of years, unchanged. Why haven't they made progress or decayed? I don't know that the computer would be able to say very much about that. Um, there would be two answers. One of them would be possibly, uh, from, a, from a long age perspective, that whatever that creature was, was well adapted to its environment and therefore just stayed around, uh, which suggests a fairly deep well out of which uh, evolutionarily it should not climb, which raises the question is why we aren't all fish or all amphibians, because they worked at one time, if that's the case. Uh, the other, the obvious one from a short age perspective is there were lots of some kinds of creatures that reproduced themselves fairly, fairly well, just like we have uh, lots of wildebeest in, uh, in Africa. Why not? And, and so when, when they all got buried, uh, there were millions upon millions of them. What about genetic entropy? Well, see, that's the thing. If, you'd, if you go that, the second route, you don't have to worry about genetic entropy because we can see, you know, the, the uh, wildebeest, or for that matter, the bison that used to be in American Plains. If a flood had come by and buried a bunch of stuff at that time, we would have found, uh, we would have found the... Uh, environment dominated by, uh, by bison and passenger pigeons. Of course, that's not true now. Passenger pigeon in particular, we'd be lucky if we got a museum specimen out of it. I guess I fail to see why genetic entropy works in us, but didn't affect these creatures that have lived for X millions of years. Um, well, they should have. Uh, a genetic entropy should have uh, should have uh, eventually destroyed the those organisms as well. One of the things about this is these are more analogous to bacteria than they are to uh, more complex creatures. Um, uh, way more analogous because. We have such a large genome, it's so easy to get a few mutations here and there. Uh, if they don't kill us outright, they'll still be there. And we have slowly degenerating genomes, assuming the first genomes were optimal or near optimal. But, um, but the problem with, uh, with genetics, uh, I mean, bacteria can multiply fast enough so that so that there is less, there's always some of the original bacteria left. So if they are more ideally suited towards growth in the wild, then they'll multiply more.
I was watching a film last night that I bought over here at our new uh, Adventist bookstore, I suppose you would call it, and it was on grizzly bears, and they're one of the slowest reproducting uh, animals, I guess, on the North American continent. So I assume if we took a look at their genome uh, chromosomes, we would find this principle probably uh, would have something to do with it. How uh, complex it would be in recent some fashion. I don't know that I can comment on that too too much. I didn't see the uh, movie. So I, I will let that pass. We have a comment back. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I guess we have one here. No, you, you speak and then we'll pass the mic back to him. No, we're recording this, so we want to, we want to get a good quality recording. And tell you what, uh, we'll pass the other mic to you. Go ahead. The computer could only deal with information that was al that already existed. Uh, the difference was that it could not create new information. And that was brought out in each one of the examples that you uh, read to us. Um, yeah, it depends on how e technically Even though you it get, could, it you could, could, get uh, maybe, could you be could started by an original, another program, mm -hmm that could feed information into it. There was no original creation outside of what already existed. And by rearranging that information, however they wanted to do it, they still could not create new information. And, and that was the key difference between that green book that you have on the desk and the, the opposite point of view that was displayed today. It, that's what I got from that. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm, I'm very careful because you can show, uh, both in the computers and in real life, you can show that about four bases can be rearranged in a more or less de novo situation. Um, if you'll look back, I, we actually had a uh, talk here called Evolution Works, and we demonstrated that in this particular virus. Uh, but it's like four bases. And it took huge amounts of um, uh, stress to do it, and actually supporting the creature that had them removed, which couldn't reproduce on its own until finally enough of a mutation happened so that it could survive on its own. Um, and interestingly enough, it simply went back to the wild type, uh, which suggests that the wild type was more or less optimally uh, coded. Um, so you can get little tiny bits of stuff that you could technically call information. But the problem is that in order to add them each at a time, you have to apply maximum um, evolutionary pressure, if you want to call it that. And the fact of the matter is that as far as we can tell, biological life is not constructed that way. Uh, not to mention the problem that you'd have that there's just not enough time to do it. So it's not a matter of it's impossible it's more of a matter that it is so highly improbable that it's not going to work. And that's one of the reasons why we want to be very careful about using words like impossible because you know, it's not impossible. You know, it's not impossible that a meteor could hit this building in the next 30 seconds and we all be dead. Nobody really worries about that. Uh, comment over, well, but you had one first. Yes, go um, ahead. Yeah, not being a <coughs> scientist, I struggle to put this in a more philosophical perspective. Now, I'm assuming that 
the Darwinists are biological scientists, at least the ones we're involved with here, and they're perfectly capable of following the argument that you just gave. If they refuse to accept your conclusion, then presumably they should be able to give you a reason why they refuse to accept the conclusion. If they can't do that, then I must assume that perhaps their conviction is grounded in considerations other than science. In fact, I would go so far as to submit that one has committed oneself to a certain worldview and we lose all criteria of falsifiability. So one accepts whatever evidence conforms to that and rejects everything else, which of course isn't very scientific at all. Uh, yes, um, I, I think in logic it is known as the no true Scotsman uh, 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 fallacy. That is, no true Scotsman would do this, uh, you know, and, but he's a Scotsman and he's doing this, but he must not be a true Scotsman because he's doing it. Well, you can't get past that defense if somebody wants to maintain it hard enough. But that makes it, as you point out, unfalsifiable and raises the very interesting question of whether that's really scientific thinking or not. Well, first of all, um, I'll just second the comment that was made. <coughs> but, um, you know, it, we when we talk about these things, we, we want to be careful and not state too much, and so we kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. But yet, um, if you think about what has to happen to evolve a new living form, uh, ultimately, we can talk about how you can gradually change things, but ultimately you have to come up with new proteins, new functions, different from something the way they were. And even if this should happen by chance, those proteins are going to be useless unless you have the whole set of regulatory genes to control them and decide what they're going to do and where and all the rest. And that, um, you know, that puts a whole different dimension on it and a number of orders of magnitude of, of difficulty. Well, you, you, think of a, you think of trying to create a snake that has venom. You're going to have to come up with the venom proteins. But you're also going to have to come up with something to tell them, only make this in the snake's venom gland. Don't make this in the intestines. Don't make this in the eye. Don't make this in the thyroid gland, um, whatever. Um, and then you're going to have to have some kind of delivery device, at the bare minimum, something that will allow you to puncture the skin. While we're on venoms, let me just uh, add something to that. We had a speaker here uh, a year or so ago, an evolution, evolutionary biologist, who talked about venoms and poisons. And he went through a whole long list of great diversity of these. And uh, basically, in every case, the, the venomous or poisonous proteins were just modifications of some normal other protein. Um, so there really was nothing new. You, you, this is just rearrangements of things to make it uh, poisonous, which I thought was very interesting. Let's see. Question here and then over there. For someone who is not very computer savvy, and there might be others here too, uh, could information that was put into this uh, program, could bias play the role into the information that was said in the program? Could one predict the outcome by the information that was put in initially? Well, so this is the problem. When they got done, they had basically only the information that was put in, plus a few van random variations. So the answer is yes. Um, they weren't trying to do a, uh, an origin of life type scenario. Nobody has any clue there. And if you read them when they're not fighting creationists or intelligent design advocates, they're free to admit that. Nobody has a clue. You may remember that uh, <laughs> Richard Dawkins fam uh, famously said that in, on, in, on camera in the movie Expelled. And I think everybody just kind of collectively gasped because he said what everybody knows but was not politically correct to say. 
Uh, there is no really good origin of life. There are some things that maybe if you think this way and maybe if you think that way, and it hasn't been disproven kind of stuff. Um, but the origin of life is, is a complete mystery to them. So they did. They started out with an ancestor, and it was a long ancestor. And then they wanted to see where it went from there if you didn't try to tweak it. And where it went from there was basically downhill. Hmm. And that's, that's the key, that this is actually, if you think about it, this is a demonstration of genetic entropy at work. Is anyone doing the same, or he's the only one who? Uh, well, there were other people who used his program and tweaked it in various ways themselves, trying to see what they could do. And uh, he's given up on it. I think most of those other people have probably given up on it too. But interestingly, Tierra still lives as one of the examples that shows that evolution works in the blogosphere. And Tira is only one chapter in this book, right? There's other things that are... Oh, yeah. One Th that's just one chapter in right. the book. Okay. And if you want to get right down to it, he'll give you ones and zeros. And if that's not enough because there, you know, there's other things in the program that you need to see, uh, you can get more explanation in the references that he gives, including Tierra itself is online. So you can, you can see exactly what codes they're done and exactly what those codes are supposed to mean. And then you can follow, you know, it mutated here, it mutated there, it mutated there, and what happened to it. You know, we like acronyms. I don't know what TIERA stands for. Maybe... Is there a, a whole string of words? I, I would have to. I would have to look at it. I, I know that it's a, you know, it's co uh, coincidental, and I doubt that it's completely coincidental that it is the Latin for Earth. Yeah, we're aware of that. Uh, another acronym that may have some parallels with this search for evolution or search for life is SETI, search for uh, intelligence on other planets. You know. Yeah, so it's uh, for in extraterrestrial intelligence. Extraterrestrial intelligence. And all of it kind of revolves around intelligence, doesn't it? It does. And what, what's happening with human beings and our cumulative intelligence, and we're able to devise computers, set up programs, have instruments that uh, peer into the farthest, darkest corners of the universe, with all of that ability, we come up with essentially nothing. I thought that's kind of interesting. So, so far, SETI has proven uh, un, uh, has not, has not uh, been able to find evidences of life. Now, of course, there are people who talk about flying saucers and stuff like that. Um, uh, that would be interesting. Um, and maybe someday we'll talk about that too. Um, given that it's getting close, I'm going to uh, let um, uh, Dr. Bottomer here uh, have the last word. Well, Seti, I've, I've always been fascinated by if we got a sequence that sounded anything like an SOS or anything, they would scream, aha, there's intelligence out there. We turn around and look at biological life and say random chance. And it just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The discontinuity between thought of those two things just seems ludicrous. You know, if, if they just got a, a dot to dot and a dash, dash, dash from outer space once, they'd say, aha, there's, there's intelligence out there. We have proof. And yet you look at DNA and you look at biological life and you say, no, it doesn't prove anything. It's random. Well, I think that's the power of a prior paradigm. And, you know, and these people are committed, and, and it depends on who they are, why they're committed. And you have to be very careful about assuming. 
Some of them are committed because it allows them a certain kind of freedom that, uh, uh, you know, freedom to damage stuff. Uh, some of them are committed because they don't want a God who burns people forever. You know, I'm with them on that one. Uh, some of them are committed because that's the way science is, that's the way they've always been taught. And I think before you reach out and, and say, that I'm going to evangelize that group, you really need to know what their original assumptions are. Um, but, uh, but I agree, I think it's, uh, I think it's co uh, commitment. That, and I understand in dealing with them, there are assumptions, you have to try and understand that. But it still doesn't justify in a scientific fas fashion not allowing the facts to have their influence. Ignoring yeah. the facts is not a scientific approach. And the overwhelming effort to ignore facts in some of this, it, while they point the finger at us, it should be, they should be a little bit embarrassed. With that, uh, we should probably stop. Um, uh, Gary is... And hopefully we'll see most of you in a little bit that uh, want to join us for a potluck. Those of you who don't have the announcement, there's a, still a few of them here. Have the address and everything. You're welcome to come. Bring whatever you can, and we'll see you. <laughs>